no face. In the morning, he pulls on his mask and grinds his fist into his palm. He goes to the guabana tree and does his pull-ups, nearly 50 now, and then he picks up the Café de Huller and holds it to his chest for a 40 count. His arms, chest, and neck bulge, and the skin around his temples draw tight, about to split. But no, he's unbeatable and drops the de Huller with a fat yes. He knows that he should go, but the morning fog covers everything, and he listens to the roosters for a while. Then he hears his family stirring. Hurry up, he says to himself. He runs past his Tio's land with a glance. He knows how many beans of cafe his Tio was, has growing, red, black, and green on his conchos. He runs past the water hose in the pasture, and then he says flight and jumps up, and his shadow knives over the tops of the trees, and he can see his family's fence and his mother washing his little brother, scrubbing his face and feet. The storekeepers toss water on the road to keep the dust down. He sweeps past them. No face, a few yell out, but he has no time for them. First, he goes to the bars, searching the nearby ground for drop change. Drunks sometimes sleep in the alley, so he moves quietly. He steps over the piss holes in the vomit, wrinkles his nose at the stink. Today, he finds enough coins in the tall, crackling weeds to buy a bottle of soda, soda or a Johnny cake. He holds the coins tightly in his hands, and under his mask, he smiles. At the hottest part of the day, Lou lets him into the church with its bad roof and poor wiring and gives him café con leche and two hours of reading and writing. The books, the pen, the paper all come from the nearby school, donated by the teacher. Father Lou has small hands and bad eyes, and twice he's gone to Canada for operations. Lou teaches him the English he'll need up north. I'm hungry. Where's the bathroom? I come from the Dominican Republic. Don't be scared. After his lessons, he buys chiclets and goes to the house across from the church. The house has a gate and orange trees and a cobblestone path. A TV trills somewhere inside. He waits for the girl, but she doesn't come out. Normally, she'd peek out and see him. She'd make a TV with her hands. They both speak with their hands. Do you want to watch? He shakes his head, but he put his hands out in front of him. He never went into Casas Ayanas. No, I like being outside. I'd rather be inside where it's cool. He'd stay until the cleaning woman, who also lived in the mountains, yelled from the kitchen, stay away from here. Don't you have any shame? Then he'd grip the bars of the gate and pull them a bit apart, grunting to show her who she was messing with. Each week, Padre Lou lets him buy a comic book. The priest takes him to the bookstore and stands in the street guarding him while he peruses the shelves. Today he buys Calamon, who takes no shit and wears a turban. If his face were covered, he'd be perfect. He watches for opportunities from corners away from people. He has power of invisibility and no one can touch him. Even his Tio, the one who guards the dam, strolls past and says nothing. Dogs can smell him, though, and a couple nuzzle his feet. He pushes them away since they can betray his location to his enemies. So many wish him to fall. So many wish him gone. Avejo needs help pushing his cart. A cat needs to be brought across the street. Hey, no face, a motor driver yells. What the hell are you doing? You aren't starting to eat cats, have you? He'll be eating kids next, another joins in. Leave that cat alone. It's not yours. He runs. It's late in the day and the shops are closing and even the motorbikes at each corner have dis dispersed, leaving oil stains and ruts in the dirt. The ambush comes when he's trying to figure out if he can buy another Johnny cake. Four boys tackle him and the coins jump out of his hand like grasshoppers. The fat boy with the single eyebrow sits on his chest and his breath flies out of. The others stand over him and he's scared. We're going to make you a girl, the fat one says, and he can hear the words echoing through the meat of the fat boy's body. He wants to breathe, but his lungs are as tight as pockets. You ever been a girl before? I bet you it hasn't. It ain't a lot of fun. He says strength and the fat boys fly off him and he's running down the street and the others are following. You better leave him alone, the owner of the beauty shop says, but no one ever listens to her, not since her husband left her for a Haitian. He makes it back to the church and slips inside and hides. The boys throw rocks against the door of the church, but then Alicio, the groundskeeper, says, boys, prepare for hell and runs his machete on the sidewalk. Everything goes quiet. He sits down under a pew and waits for nighttime, when he can go back home to the smokehouse to sleep.
He rubs the blood on his shorts, spits on the cut to get the dirt out. Are you okay? Padre Lou asks. I've been running out of energy. Padre Lou sits down. He looks like one of those Cuban shopkeepers in his shorts and his guabera. He pats his hands together. I've been thinking about you up north. I'm trying to imagine you in the snow. Snow won't bother me. Snow bothers everybody. Do they like wrestling? Padre Lou laughs, almost as much as we do, except no one gets cut up, not anymore. He comes out from under the pew then and shows the priest his elbow. The priest sighs. Let's go take care of that, okay? Just don't use the red stuff. We don't use the red stuff anymore. We have the white stuff now, and it doesn't hurt. I'll believe that when I see it. No one has ever hidden it from him. <clears throat> they tell him the story over and over again, as though afraid that he might forget. On some nights, he opens his eyes, and the pig has come back always huge and pale. Its hooves peg his chest down and he can smell the curdled bananas on its breath. Blunt teeth rip a strip from under his eyes and the muscle revealed is delicious, like lechosa. He turns his head to save one side of his face. In some dreams, he saves the right side and in some the left, but in the worst one, he cannot turn his head. Its mouth is like a pothole and nothing can escape it. When he awakens, he's screaming and blood braids down his neck. He's bitten his tongue and it swells and he cannot sleep up again until he tells himself to be a man. Padre Lou borrows a Honda motorcycle and the two set out early in the morning. He leans into the turns and Lou says, don't do that too much, you'll tip us. Nothing will happen to us, he yells. The road to Okoka is empty and the fincas are dry and many of the farmlands have been abandoned. On a bluff, he sees a single black horse. It's eating a shrub, and a garza is perched on its back. The clinic is crowded with bleeding people, but a nurse with bleached hair brings them through to the front. How are we today, the doctor says. I'm fine, he says. When are you sending me away? The doctor smiles and makes him remove his mask and then massages his face and his thumbs with his thumbs. The doctor has colorless food in his teeth. Have you had trouble swallowing? No. Breathing? No. Have you had any headaches? Does your throat ever hurt? Are you ever dizzy? Never. The doctor checks his eyes, his ears, and then listens to his breathing. Everything looks good, Lou. I'm glad to hear that. Do you have a ballpark figure? Well, the doctor says, we'll get him there eventually. Padre Lou smiles and puts a hand on his shoulder. What do you think about that? He nods, but doesn't know what he should think. He's scared of the operations and scared that nothing will change and that the Canadian doctors will fail like the Santeras his mother hired, who called every spirit in the celestial directory for help. The room he's in is hot and dim and dusty, and he's sweating and wishes he could lie under a table where no one can see. In the next room, he met a boy whose skull plates are not closed all the way, and a girl who didn't have arms, and a baby whose face was huge and swollen and whose eyes were dripping pus. You can see my brain, the boy says. All I have is this membrane thing, and you can see right into it. In the morning, he wakes up hurting from the doctor, from a fight he had outside the church. He goes outside dizzy and leans against the guabana tree. His little brother, Pesau, is awake, flicking beans at the chickens. His little body bowed and perfect, and when he rubs the four-year-old's head, he feels the sores that have healed into yellow crusts. He aches to pick at them, but the last time the blood had gushed and Pesau had screamed. Where have you been, Pesau asked. I've been fighting evil. I want to do that. You won't like it, he says. Pesau looks at his face, giggles, and flings another pebble at the hens, who scatter indignantly. He watches the sun burn the mist from the fields, and despite the heat, the beans are thick and green and flexible in the breeze. His mother sees him on the way back from the outhouse. She goes to fetch his mask. He's tired and aching, <clears throat> but he looks over the valley. And the way the land curves away to hide itself reminds him of the way Lou hides his dominoes when they play. Go, she says, before your father comes out. He knows what happens when his father comes out. He pulls on his mask and feels the fleas stirring in the cloth. When she turns her back, he hides, blending into the weeds. He watches his mother hold Pesau's head gently under the faucet. And when the water finally urges out from the pipe, Pesau yells as if he's been given a present or a wish come true. He runs down towards town, never slipping or stumbling. Nobody's faster. <laughs>